This is Radio TV Phono Nut, and here's another example of one of the cheap five tube AM radios that was available back in the 60s. This one is a Claricon, and even though the cabinet is a little bit different than the last one we featured, I suspect the chassis is still the same, or pretty much basically the same. Now, I looked up the Sam's photo fact on this, and it's dated 1966. Yes, Sam's even covered some of these. But that's really not anything that we can bank on, because like I previously said in the last video on the other Japanese radio, these things were made from the late 50s, and I recently talked to somebody, and after showing them a picture of this radio, they said they received one just like it for Christmas in 1971. So, obviously these things were made for a long for a long period of time. Now, the person I got this from says it hums, but I'd like to pull the chassis out and examine it before we plug it in and see if the death cap has already blown up. If it hasn't, we're going to go ahead and cut it out of the circuit because... The death cap, and that's the cap that's across the AC power line, is bad about shorting and blowing up in these, and I just would rather it not happen if possible. Even as cheap as this radio is, they were still kind enough to give us a schematic diagram, and it looks like it is a hot chassis, so if you have one of these, you want to be careful as far as not not operating it with the with the knobs removed because you might get a nasty pop here's the chassis and even though it's laid out different than the other one uh, it's still basically the same circuit here's our little puny ferrite antenna there's the filter capacitor uh, a little three inch speaker there this one does use the uh, tube retainer clips which is nice I wish more of the American sets had to use those Here's the underside of the chassis. On this one, I only see two paper capacitors. The rest of them are ceramic disc, which is nice. The one right here is the across-the-line capacitor that likes to blow up, so we're going to just cut it loose for the test. It will eventually be replaced, but now we can just cut it out for a first-time power-up. Yep, bad filter cap. So that's going to have to be replaced. Not getting any stations under the hum, so there may be other things wrong too, but we'll just conquer one battle at a time here. Well, looking at this closer, I can tell that they had safety in mind when they built this. This is indeed a hot chassis, but they have the rear apron that mounts the chassis to the cabinet in the back here, these screws, alright, that's chassis, as you can tell, this is insulated, as is the volume control shaft, and the tuning condenser, you can see it's insulated from the chassis too, so, for this to be a little cheap radio, they, they did put, put a little effort into this. Now the Claricon brand, I'm not really that familiar with it. I've seen it occasionally on these little cheap tube radios, and I've also seen it on some CB radios and some all-in-one stereos and such from the early 70s. I remember years ago, my friend of my mother's had a little Claricon 8-track player. It was just a 8-track player only, no radio or record player, and a couple of little speakers. It was in a little wooden box, and... You know, for what it was, it was decent quality. I think it had an AC motor in it. So, but I don't remember seeing anything with that brand on it newer than the early to mid 70s. So, they must have went out of business pretty early on. All right, now we need to find a couple of capacitors. The one in here is a one section's a 40 and the other section's a 20, so we should be able to come up with those without any problem. Now I'll see about mount some terminal strips under here to where I can mount the new capacitors. I'll try to leave the old one in place for aesthetics. 
I just don't like holes in a chassis, you know, where something else used to be. All I have is, is two of these. So what I might do is mount the terminal strips on the rear chassis apron and just connect the negative leads of the capacitors here to this original negative ground point on the original capacitor. Or I might try to put them here. I will just have to see what we can squeeze in here. All right, I think I'm going to put one filter capacitor on a terminal strip here and the other one on the on the back chassis apron. Now don't worry, the, the this isolated part won't be connected to anything. It's just going to be used for physically mounting a terminal strip. All right, this resistor that's in the filter network is a 1K ohm resistor, or at least that's what it's marked. Uh, it's really too big for me to... When I'm putting the filter capacitor here, it's really going to be kind of a tight fit. So I guess it's a good thing uh, that this resistor measures 2,000 ohms because we're going to really want to get this out of here and put one of our more modern resistors in there that's a lot smaller than this one. And that way we can fit everything where it's supposed to be. Well, correction, this is a 2K ohm resistor. Sometimes when looking at these things from certain angles, sometimes red looks like brown, and you, know, you can see how that can easily happen. So this is indeed a 2K ohm resistor, and it's measuring right on 2K. So uh, I really hate to chop it out, so we may try to see if we can squeeze it in here. If not, we'll just have to put one of our smaller, more modern resistors in its place. And another problem I noticed that explains why we weren't receiving any, any radio reception is it looks like somebody at one time attempted to attach an external antenna wire to the original loop stick antenna and probably didn't tie any kind of strain relief or anything like that. And somebody yanked on the wire and it pulled the pull the connection straight off of the uh, loop stick, so we're either going to have to repair that if we can, or just replace the loop stick with something else. I can't imagine this little bitty puny thing being very effective, really. These little radios like this are mainly only good for local reception anyway, so you can see why, you know, with a little puny antenna like that. All right, I had the filters and the across-the-line firecracker replaced. The original was original was a point zero four seven. I didn't have any safety capacitors left in that value, so I just went with a point one. It's really not that critical, and these safety capacitors are designed to fail open and never to fail shorted. But we all know, never say never when it comes to electronics. Now I know I need to fix this antennas, but let's fire it up first and see if the hum goes away. Well now I turn it on and I get smoke from this resistor right here, the one between the filter capacitors. Surely we didn't wire something up wrong, did we? We couldn't have possibly done that. Alright, I found the problem. Not necessarily a mistake I made, but just a wire that was too touchy-feely with something to begin with, and I guess me working on it got it to be extremely too touchy-feely. You see right there that wire coming off of the B-plus going over to this tube socket and various other places, you can see it's shorted to that bolt that holds the IF transformer in place. I have our one side of our meter connected to the chassis and I'll now touch my meter lead to the output of this resistor and it reads zero ohms. That explains why it's smoking like crazy. So let me let me back this out of the way and see if a short goes away. And the short went away. So now we ought to be able to plug the radio in and it not smoke. All right, I just moved that out of the way, so maybe it won't get touchy-feely with anything again. All right, that's better. I'm hearing static instead of seeing smoke from a burning resistor.
And it's actually picking up a little something, even with that, even with that broke antenna. Alright, let's see if I can fix this antenna. I'm probably going to have to replace it. I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to deal with that little micro wire on there. But yeah, had this been a solid state piece of equipment, that short could have, well, it would have probably gone up in a puff of smoke and that would have been it. Well, maybe not given where the, where it was, but still, this tube stuff is a lot more lot more forgiving when it comes to that sort of thing than solid state equipment. Alright, after much eye strain and much magnification I found the end of the wire and there was some copper exposed on it. So I took a piece of old bare wire and ran it under through the hole and under the uh, the uh, cardboard coil form here or whatever it's made out of and bent it over and Bob soldered it on and fortunately it made contact with the exposed wire. I'm reading about 7 ohms. So now we can put it back in the set and try to solder it back up and hope our connection maintains itself and then we'll see if it'll... Well now I've done gone and messed up uh, whenever I was trying to clean off this solder blob from this wire here and I should have moved it over to the side but I didn't and then solder drops down in the tuning capacitor and now I can't get it out of the plates. It seems like when I want solder to stick to something, it won't stick. But whenever I don't want it to stick to something, like down in this tuning capacitor, it sticks with ultimate ease. All right, we got it on there, and I think I got the solder out of the tuning condenser. Alright, we've still got a ways to go, and this speaker voice call is rubbing. I don't know if you can hear that on camera, but that's eventually going to have to be replaced. And I'm going to put some glue on that terminal that we repaired to try to stabilize that, because it could very easily pop loose. So I think that's where we're going to leave it tonight. I'm going to glue it up, let it sit overnight, come back tomorrow and recharge the battery on this camera and then we'll tackle this again. I got the radio perked up by replacing this capacitor in the AVC line and touched up the alignment but the next thing we have to worry about is the raspy sounding speaker and here it is three and a half inch speaker cone they couldn't use just a standard speaker with standard mounting. No, they had to use this type of speaker that mounts with one screw on the back back here. I had this 3.5 inch standard mount, mount speaker that I salvaged out of a junk radio. I was going to just solder it to the chassis here. And there's two problems with that. If I get too close here, it's going to touch the volume control shaft that's isolated. And also, it sticks up too tall to fit in the cabinet, so I don't know how we're going to do this. Raspy sounding speakers just get on my nerves. It just drives me crazy, but I'm not going to have this reconed. It's not worth that much. What I may end up doing is just busting the cone out of this speaker and mounting a little pocket radio speaker inside of this frame and then mounting this speaker back in the radio and calling it done. I mean, this thing's pretty tinny sounding anyway, so it really don't much matter. And, you know, like I said, this is not something I'm going to be using all the time, but when I use it, I don't want to hear raspy sounds like this speaker dragging. 
and I think I know how I'm going to do this. I salvaged this little speaker out of a tape recorder, and it's precisely the right cone size, but not the right mount. Finding one with the right mount would be a royal pain, so what I've done is soldered a terminal strip to the back of the speaker, and then I'm going to solder the terminal strip to the chassis, and that ought to hold it in good enough. It's a tight fit in the cabinet, so once I slide the chassis back in, the the speaker front will make contact with the cabinet, and I don't see it going anywhere. All right, there we go. President Pence denied that. Lisa? Well, Thomas, who says his client will plead not guilty. Epstein was found dead in his cell in August, awaiting trial for abusing teenage girls. The Dow Down 100. I'm Mike Moss. If you're drowning... And they needed that, that win because guess what? Raider Chili will customize sugars of insurance, so you only pay for what you need. I've actually been moonlighting as a DJ. Ah, check it! Oh. Here's the fun part! Alright, let's put this thing back in the case and we're done with it. Over and over again. Alright, so there it is, back by together. The way, withholding aid. The options on the Liberty National Dealer Price and Dairy. See dealer for details about cost and terms. Only valid on 2018 or 2019 Mercedes Benz printer vans, excluding cash passing qualified commercial customers only. Financing offer valid through January 2nd, 2020. Consult your tax advisor. For more information on this bank file, visit MD Vans. Warning. This product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. The world is changing. I know my radios and TVs that I find sometimes are addicted to nicotine. They're sure covered in enough of it. And once again, just giving you a reminder of our selection of AM around here. At the risk of one of the uh, sports, an athlete, a Southern preacher. gospel and preaching, very poor sounding R and B station. My goodness, Clay Travis is back at it again. News, talk, sports. Okay, I have a problem with and that. news talk, and that's it. For a president to that are substantial for both college football and the NFL. The injury to Tua is severe to his hip. He is out for the remainder of the season. All right. That's enough. It can go on the shelf and might turn it on again in another year just to see if it plays.